In Las Vegas, an ex-convict is back to his old ways. Big money cons, low-level burglary, and violent assaults. Local police track him, but he's gone. The FBI joins the case, and the violence escalates. To capture the desperate fugitive, authorities need to anticipate his next move. Women are most often assaulted by someone they know, but sometimes a stranger attacks. Near Las Vegas in December of 2000, a young woman became the latest victim of a violent sex offender. Before authorities could locate him, he would add murder to his list of crimes. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. FBI agents tracked the armed fugitive across the country, and as they closed in, the gunman was determined to avoid capture at any cost. Las Vegas, Nevada. Beneath the bright lights are thousands of workers keeping the town running and criminals ready to take whatever they can. Early on the morning of December 11th, 2000, in the Las Vegas suburb of Henderson, a 17-year-old waitress was on her way to work. In a parking lot, a man offered her a ride to work. Who's going to work? She declined. Go, get in. Get in. Open. Hurry up, move, get in. His gun stopped Go, her from move. crying out. He drove her to a secluded area where he sexually assaulted her. As soon as she could, she took her only chance and fled, running to a nearby restaurant to call 911. Henderson police took the call. Are you injured? Do you need an ambulance, ma'am? The girl gave a description of her attacker and his vehicle. Did he have any weapons? The patrol officer headed to the restaurant to interview the young woman and take her to a nearby medical center. En route, he spotted a red sports car that matched the description given by the victim. When the officer approached, driver sped away. As they neared the city and busier streets, the suspect's driving became more erratic. The officer decided the risk to civilians was too great and pulled back. The police now had the vehicle's license plate. Henderson PD ran the tags and traced the vehicle to a Las Vegas address. Las Vegas detective Barry Jensen contacted the owner, who explained he had given the car to his daughter to use.
The owner said he and his daughter, Rachel Mills, would meet Detective Jensen at her apartment. She had just gotten off work from a local casino. When the detective arrived, he told them about the car eluding police and reported sexual assault. Rachel said that her husband had the car that morning. He had dropped her off at work at 5 a.m. and she had not seen him since. She hoped there had been some mistake. She knew that he had been arrested for sexual assault in the past. She knew that he had been in prison but she didn't believe any of that was true, or she didn't want to believe that any of that was true. Rachel had noticed their car had been parked across the lot. Detective Jensen asked her to check the apartment and see if her husband had returned. He and her father would check out the car. Looking around the apartment, she realized that her husband had taken most of his belongings. It appeared as if he had left her. The father owned the car, but since Rachel and her husband were the regular drivers, only they could consent to a search. His stuff is gone. His clothes, the, the drawers, his, uh, all the stuff he keeps on the dresser, uh, photos, I don't know, everything seems, it's gone. Could you give me your verbal consent to search the car without getting a search warrant? Oh, okay, okay. Then you got a set of keys. Uh, yeah. Though shaken by what was happening, Rachel gave Jensen permission to search the vehicle. The detective believed the placement of the car far from the apartment was telling. In my opinion, it was hidden in the parking lot. I think he knew the police were going to find his apartment. If his car wasn't parked right out front, I think he felt that he, he had more time. He was creating more distance between law enforcement and himself. Inside the car, Jensen noticed that the few personal effects matched what the assault victim described pointing more suspicion toward Rachel's husband. She said he didn't have a regular job, but beyond that, Rachel and her father were unable to give the detective much more information. All they were able to tell us was that he loved to play blackjack and craps. They had no idea where he was getting the money to do that. Jensen called for crime scene technicians to process the car in case there was unseen evidence inside. It's going to be about 15 minutes for the tow truck to get here. Um, he had to tell Rachel that her husband was a strong suspect in the assault of a 17-year-old girl. Um, At his request, she gave Jensen a photo of her husband, Magfour Mansour. If Mansour was the assailant, Jensen hoped the victim could ID him based on the photo. I want you to look at every picture. Take at the time. police station, Detective Jensen interviewed the young woman. She identified Magfour Mansour as her attacker. Nevada police charged him with kidnapping and sexual assault. Jensen found that Mansour had an extensive rap sheet He'd been arrested several times for sexual related offenses, sexual assault, open and gross lewdness. He'd also been arrested for burglaries, credit card fraud, and weapons violations. While in prison, Mansour had been diagnosed with a severe personality disorder that bordered on sociopathic. He was a sophisticated con artist. He could make people do things that they wouldn't normally do. He was a serial rapist and a career criminal. For several days, police had no good leads on the case. Then Jensen got a tip from a new ally. Sexual assault, Jensen. Mansoor's father-in-law. Yeah, Richard. He'd been digging around, 
talking to family friends, and he knew that Monsieur was a big gambler at one of the local hotels, and he felt that he would have a room there. I found that he did have a room that was comped because he was a large money player. Since hotel security had cameras in the hallways, the detective asked them to watch and call police if anyone entered Mansour's room. They weren't set up to make an arrest or to grab Monsieur. I didn't feel comfortable asking them to because I believed that he was dangerous. That night, a security officer spotted a man entering Mansour's room. He immediately contacted Las Vegas police. He had his hotel security. He has returned to the hotel. Okay. Detectives were on their way. But the man exited the room less than a minute after he went in and casually slipped away. When the vice squad detectives arrived, they checked his room. We found a suitcase and some family pictures, nothing else that would help her further our investigation. They searched the entire hotel casino, but there was no sign of Mansoor. They realized in order to find him, they needed more resources and turned the case over to Special Agent Scott Backen and Detective Brian Dunaway of the Las Vegas FBI's Criminal Apprehension Team, a multi-agency squad responsible for tracking down fugitives in the Las Vegas area. The squad's first step was to distribute informational sheets about Mansoor to area hotels. When we have someone that we're looking for and we believe that he's gone to a hotel or something, we have a system called TRAX, T-R-A-X, which is a, uh, it's a fancy fax machine. It allows us to send digital, color digital photos to large groups of people simultaneously to uh, alert them. Um, those people that don't have TRAX alerts, we uh, went to old-fashioned police work. We were knocking on doors and delivering these things and, and conducting interviews and making sure that everyone knew about him. We're looking for this guy right here. He comes under a few different aliases. Investigators check registers for known aliases of Mansoor. They found nothing. These two gentlemen are from the FBI. But some security personnel recognize Mansoor as a suspect in a string of room burglaries plaguing the Vegas Strip. They described his frequent cons. They said Mansoor preyed on tourists, mostly those of Middle Eastern or Asian origin. The to the second floor. Okay, thank you. He would often pose as a, a translator or as a tour guide, and uh, he would do this in order to gain the confidence of people that were in town who had money. After gaining their confidence, he would use this information to usually enter their rooms because he was able to contact the, the hotel staff and, and pose as these people. When the tourists returned to their rooms, they found them ransacked. Over several days, Mansoor had stolen more than a quarter of a million dollars in cash and jewelry. We have been completely robbed. We have been robbed. Everything is gone. Agent Backen believed the suspect would use the money to flee Nevada. We obtained an unlawful flight to avoid prosecution warrant, which is a federal warrant, uh, charging him with fleeing one state and going to another uh, to avoid prosecution for the underlying charge, which was sexual assault. Uh, with the federal warrant, it allowed us to engage other FBI officers around the country in searching for uh, Mansoor. They tried to narrow the scope of the nationwide search by reviewing any piece of information they could find regarding the suspect. We were able to uh, gather INS records, immigration records, that type of stuff, and we found that he had been in, in their custody for, for a great deal of time. And, uh, and he was here citing some sort of religious persecution. Um, and then we were able to pull in the, the records from uh, New Jersey and the, the other places that he had been at. We found that he had been involved in gambling fraud, generally property crimes types of things. Mansoor's wife gave them long-distance phone records which showed many calls to casinos around the country. 
we began developing a profile of him as, as a gambler. And once we did that, we focused our, our investigation on the gambling establishments. One of the gambling communities they notified was New Orleans. Casinos there should look out for it. On the morning of January 9th, 2001, 29 days after the Las Vegas sexual assault and kidnapping, a man in an obvious wig appeared at the New Orleans airport, paying cash, he booked a flight to Las Vegas under the name Francis Gabriel. In the middle of the transaction, he changed his destination to Los Angeles. Ticket agents are trained to spot suspicious activity. Security, please? Yes. She notified airport police. The wig, cash, and odd behavior was enough probable cause for the undercover officer to question the man. Followed him outside. Then asked to see his identification ticket. Like I'm asking you, you got your ticket. authorities would learn the identity of the carjacker and join the hunt for an elusive fugitive. Yeah, I'm at door 6A. I ran up on the roof. In January 2001, Las Vegas authorities hunted fugitive Magfor Mansour, suspected of robbery, kidnapping, and sexual assault. A month later at the New Orleans airport, a man in a disguise assaulted a police officer, then escaped in a carjacked pickup truck. Undercover Jefferson Parish police assigned to the airport reported the incident. And an APB for the truck and its driver went out to police in nearby parishes. Thirty minutes later, a St. Charles Parish deputy spotted the pickup truck 10 miles from the airport. He called in the plates, confirming it was the stolen truck. But the deputy knew there was construction ahead, so he did not pursue at high speed. The truck entered the road construction zone. But the driver was not going to stop and swerved toward a highway worker. The St. Charles Parish deputy arrived seconds later. Seeing the worker down, he called for an ambulance, then went to check the truck. The carjacker was gone. At the airport, police searched a piece of luggage the fugitive had dropped. Since it was left unattended on airport property, Lieutenant Glenn Toka did not need a warrant. We found some identification with a photograph of the suspect, an Italian passport, 
when we checked that, it was found to have been a stolen passport, which the suspect had obviously placed his photograph on. Police also found a list of stolen credit card numbers, players' cards from casinos throughout the United States, and multiple social security numbers. Because of possible interstate fraud, Jefferson Parish Police called the New Orleans FBI. They forwarded the photo and name used on the stolen passport to Special Agent Sandra Zuli. We immediately started running that name through our system to try to identify photographs of anyone that, that used that name. The photo of fugitive Magfour Mansour, wanted out of Las Vegas, matched the one on the passport. Calling Vegas to learn more details, Zuli confirmed it was him. Despite the best efforts of the emergency personnel, the highway worker died of his injuries. Authorities began their search for Mansour at the truck and worked outward from there. Lieutenant Toka joined the search near the Mississippi River. We did about a mile radius uh, search, plus the state police helped us on, on the perimeters that were doing the search. We had a helicopter up, plus we had uh, tracking dogs in the location. The area's landscape made it difficult. There are buildings, uh, tugboats, wharves. It's a, it's a working area, and there's a lot of abandoned warehouses there, uh, derelict barges up on the ground and everything. They searched for more than 24 hours, checking every conceivable hiding place. We uh, theorized that he had either gone into the river and drowned, or that he had made his way out of the uh, security envelope. Still, authorities had to assume that Mansoor was alive. They hoped to determine where the fugitive had been while in New Orleans. Perhaps he would go back there. They reviewed airline passenger lists and surveillance tapes to reconstruct the fugitive's movements. The day before, he had come down from Connecticut into New Orleans, and we were able to track him to some local casinos that he was at that night, and then the next day he was supposed to be flying out, and that's when he was confronted by the officer. Mansoor's behavior pattern was clear. We felt that eventually he would show up at, at a casino, and that's why we focused on the casino security departments to make sure they were alerted to look for him under, in, a, in possibly a disguise. Mag for a mod Authorities also broadcast his photo and the aliases he used, hoping the public could help find him. Anyone with information was asked to call a dedicated tip line. Police immediately began receiving sightings. One came from a motorist who thought he had seen Mansoor the night the highway worker was killed. The motorist said that night he'd been driving behind a taxi on a road near the airport. He saw a man come out of the woods and hail the taxi. It looked like Mansoor. But police could not find the taxi driver, and the trail went cold. We were receiving numerous reports of, of individuals who they felt looked like, like this individual walking down the road, uh, sitting at a bar, at a casino, and all of these were checked out. Yet none of the sightings led to Mansoor. The next lead came from officers patrolling the nearby Mississippi River. Shortly after the disappearance, we received a call of a body that they located floating at the bank of the river. And we knew that in the file from the Las Vegas division that we had dental records of Mag Four Mansoor who had dental work done while in prison. So we obtained the dental records and had a comparison done. The records did not match. 
Mansour's whereabouts were still unknown. And now that he was wanted for killing a man, he'd be more desperate than ever to avoid them. Wanted on a charge of sexual assault and kidnapping, fugitive Magfour Mansour disappeared from Las Vegas. Weeks later, he resurfaced in New Orleans where he carjacked a truck and killed a highway worker. Not only was he moving quickly across jurisdictions, he was also using multiple identities, according to FBI Special Agent Sandra Zuli. Mag Foreman saw utilize so many different aliases. We determined that he was stealing identification cards on a regular basis while he was staying in the, in the casino area. The player's cards that we located in the luggage were determined to be stolen from casinos. Some of those players' cards were from casinos in Atlantic City. To follow up on them, Louisiana agents contacted the FBI's Newark field office. Special Agent Joseph Fury checked on a casino player's card Mansour used under the name Yasser Hamid. I called the hotel casino and talked to the senior vice president in charge of security, and he advised me that Mr. Hamid had in fact been a player at their casino and on January 3rd of 2001 had played and won approximately $50,000. That was six days before the airport incident in New Orleans. But considering Mansoor's lavish gambling lifestyle, the money probably would not last long. If he was desperate for money, we thought he might come back to Atlantic City to gamble again. Agent Fury learned a New Jersey phone number had been found in Mansoor's luggage. We didn't know the reason he had the number, whether or not he had ever called the number, or who was on the receiving end of that call. Okay. Authorities traced the number to a house in the Atlantic City suburb of Brigantine and set up surveillance on it. They knew the house belonged to a local cab driver, but little else. Agents watched on the slim chance the house might be connected to Mansoor. Other teams of agents also searched the gambling community of Atlantic City. We distributed wanted posters to all of the hotel casinos in Atlantic City, as well as Atlantic City Police Department and New Jersey State Police. Someone, somewhere, was bound to run into the elusive killer. Yet months went by with no sign of him. Then, at an Atlantic City hotel on the night of May 4, 2001, a vacationing Pennsylvania state trooper and his wife returned to their room. Honey? Yeah. And discovered they weren't alone. Get over there. The trooper recognized Mansoor from wanted posters. He knew the man had killed before. But for some reason, Mansoor left without harming the couple or taking any money. The state trooper notified the hotel about Mansoor and asked them to call the FBI. Mansoor had emerged from hiding, now with a gun, again, a threat to anyone who ran across him. Yes, thank you, Are you okay? As the case progressed, I knew he was a desperate man, living a life of luxury, which he didn't earn, and he was desperate to avoid law enforcement contact. Two days later, at 6.30 in the morning, a casino ATM alerted hotel security of someone attempting to use a stolen credit card to obtain a cash advance. Come here a second. I need to show you something real quick. Check this guy out here on the uh, ATM machine here. Why don't you go check that out for me? See what's going on. One of the hotel security officers confronted the cardholder who calmly explained the card belonged to him. He claimed he had reported it stolen 
but found it again that morning and forgot to cancel the hold on it. Asked for identification, the man handed the security officer an Indian passport that had been obviously altered. When the security officer tried to bring the man in for questioning, he pulled a gun. Don't follow me. Don't move. You got it. Don't follow me. Then fled. Though the officer didn't know it yet, the man he was trying to take into custody was Magfour Mansour. The suspect jumped into a nearby taxi and forced the driver to help him escape. Hotel security called the incident in to Atlantic City Police. Several units mobilized to find the carjacked taxi. But once again, Mansour was one step ahead. When he got distracted, the driver took a chance. Minutes later, witnesses outside the Taj Mahal casino saw a well-dressed man leave a taxi idling at the curb and disappear inside. Fielding the calls about the incidents, Atlantic City police believed Mansoor must be involved. Authorities immediately responded to the Taj Mahal. Witnesses' descriptions match the fugitive. And detectives found an altered Indian passport, the one from the ATM incident. The photo was of Magfour Mansour. The cab driver stated that Mansour told him he would shoot and kill him, as well as any police officer who stopped him, and he would not go back to jail. At that point, we kind of stepped up the investigation, knowing that it wasn't a one-time incident. It was an individual who was on a crime spree and seemed to be on a downward spiral. Magfur Mansour had eluded authorities for months. Now, as agents surrounded the massive Taj Mahal casino, they hoped they finally had him cornered. The FBI sought Magfur Mansour for kidnapping, sexual assault, carjacking, and second-degree murder. He had eluded them in Las Vegas and New Orleans. In May of 2001, he surfaced in Atlantic City. Hoping finally to stop him, FBI Special Agent Joseph Fury organized a search of the hotel casino Mansour was seen entering. We established a command post at the Taj Mahal with the Atlantic City Police Department, the New Jersey State Police, as well as security personnel from the Taj Mahal in an effort to locate Mansoor, thinking that he may be in the hotel somewhere. But Mansoor wouldn't be easy to find. The 1,200-room hotel boasts a 135,000-square-foot casino and is often filled with thousands of guests. And in service areas, there are dozens of hallways with plenty of offices and storage rooms to hide in. Investigators had to clear each one. Clear, coming out. Authorities feared Mansoor had escaped again. They broadened the search area. New Jersey State Police and Atlantic City Police canvassed the entire hotel casino, as well as every hotel casino in Atlantic City. They found nothing. Somehow, Mansoor had slipped away.
investigators requested security tapes from all Atlantic City hotel casinos, hoping to find a lead. After reviewing hundreds of hours of tapes, they finally spotted Mansoor. He was getting out of a cab, checking the taxi's identification number. State police learned it was owned by an independent operator living outside of Atlantic City in Brigantine. I asked what the cab driver's name was and the location where they were going, and they told me a name which came back to the individual who I had been surveilling in anticipation of Mansoor returning to the Atlantic City area. Authorities returned to the Brigantine house with a search warrant and a SWAT team. The SWAT team moved into position. To get the cab driver out of the house, an agent called inside, posing as a dispatcher. He told the driver that one of his regular fares needed a ride. We felt that if Mansoor was inside, it might be a hostage type situation. But the driver emerged alone, and they pulled him away so they could talk to him safely. The driver said no one else was in the house, but the arrest team had to be sure. Disappointment. Okay. Authorities returned to the state police barracks to interview the cab driver. He said he had driven Mansoor around the Atlantic City area several times in recent years. They had become friends, but now he was more than willing to cooperate. He immediately told us that Mansoor had been at his house that morning, had pulled a gun on him, and had ordered him to drive him towards Philadelphia, which was approximately an hour drive from Atlantic City. He actually drove Mansoor into Philadelphia and dropped him off. The driver hadn't called police because Mansoor knew where he lived, and he was afraid he would come back to get him. Fury notified the FBI's Philadelphia field office that Mansoor might be there. I then drove from Atlantic City to Philadelphia with pictures of Mansoor and assisted the Philadelphia division. Sir, uh, FBI. A couple the agents went to a bus station near where Mansoor was dropped off, looking for anyone who had seen him. We showed the picture to several counter attendants, one who recognized the picture and said that Mansoor had purchased a bus ticket to New York. Yes, sir. Okay. It seemed Mansoor had gone to Philadelphia only to make his trail more difficult to follow. On May 9th, 2001, the FBI added Magfur Mansoor to its 10 most wanted fugitives list. This made him a top priority for every FBI agent in the nation, according to Task Force member Brian Dunaway. Him being on the FBI's Most Wanted does a few things. It, it, it allocates a, a great deal more resources to the investigation, and it places a $50,000 reward for his capture. The following day, security at Atlantic City's Taj Mahal Resort reported that a gunman matching Mansoor's description had robbed the hotel jewelry store of $300,000 worth of watches. Surveillance video captured the plate number of the limo Mansoor used to escape. At the Newark field office, the FBI questioned the limousine driver. He said he had picked Mansoor up in New York City earlier that day. 
When Mansour had called for the limo, he asked to be picked up on a certain street corner. The driver didn't know where he was staying. He said Mansour seemed like any other high-stakes gambler. But around 8 o'clock, he heard security alarms. Then Mansour jumped in and ordered him to speed away. The driver followed orders. Mansour had a gun. The fugitive got out of the limousine five blocks from the robbed hotel and hopped into another cab, a white Crown Victoria with New Jersey plates. The FBI asked local police to issue an all-points bulletin for white Crown Victoria cabs in Atlantic City. That night, police stopped every taxi matching the description. Eventually, they found the driver who had picked up Mansour. He reported that he had taken the man to Philadelphia and dropped him off at the airport. The FBI learned that only two flights had departed Philadelphia late enough for Mansour to have boarded. Both were bound for Las Vegas. Manifests did not show Mansour's name but he might be flying under an alias they did not know yet. If Mansour were on either flight, authorities in Las Vegas would be ready for him. In the pre-dawn hours of May 11, 2001, the FBI believed deadly fugitive Magfour Mansour might be aboard one of two flights to Las Vegas. New Jersey FBI Special Agent Joseph Fury kept working as the planes traveled cross-country. I contacted the Las Vegas Division to advise them that Mansour had committed the armed robbery in Atlantic City, and he may in fact be en route back to Las Vegas. The Las Vegas Police Department, as well as the FBI, were at the airport waiting for both planes to arrive. Vegas detective Brian Dunaway had been tracking Mansour from the beginning. He knew how dangerous and desperate the fugitive was. Everyone that we had talked to, um, everyone that knew anything about him, knew that he wasn't going to go back to jail. He had made those statements. And his actions were just of such desperation that, that he wasn't a person that wasn't going to face these charges. And his previous incarcerations and the, the records that they kept on him there, there was just no way he was going back. So he, he was going to go out in a blaze of glory. Mansour frequently used disguises and false IDs to travel. But he wasn't on the first flight. When the second plane landed, agents cleared it, too. From the limo driver they'd interviewed, they knew he had last stayed in New York City. At that point, I contacted Special Agent Ted Miller of the New York Division to advise him that Mansour was not on either flight that went to Las Vegas, and it would be more likely that he would be in New York City. Reviewing Mansour's phone records from Las Vegas, agents interviewed Mansour's associates in New York, reminding them of the $50,000 reward. Eventually, they tracked down Mansour's regular limo driver in the city. In New York, it's very hard to get a taxi cab, and you have several private limos that will be at your beck and call, and this limo driver was willing to drive Mansour because he seemed to have quite a bit of money. He said he hadn't seen Mansour recently. But on previous trips, he always picked Mansour up from the same Midtown Hotel. The limo driver was cooperative. 
and was going to take them to an area where he thought Mansoor was staying. It was approximately 6 in the morning when Agent Miller advised me they had located the hotel. FBI agents, New York City police, and U.S. Marshals headed to the hotel. Special Agent Timothy Letourneau was part of the arrest team. We got a call from Special Agent Miller saying, the subject Mansoor committed an armed robbery last night at the Taj Mahal Casino in Atlantic City, and we believe he retreated to New York, and we think we have good leads that he may be at the hotel located at West 47th Street. The investigators set up on surveillance outside. Before the stakeout, they had been briefed on the case and warned of the danger. We talked about how he brandished a handgun during several crimes he committed. We talked about the armed rape of a 17-year-old girl and a murder he committed in Louisiana. So we knew about his propensity to violence. Several investigators went to check with the front desk. The clerk was able to confirm that Mansoor had used one of his aliases to check in. He gave them Mansoor's room number, but didn't know if he was there. Our plan at that time was we were going to make a ruse phone call into the room. We believed Mansoor might be staying in. We had agents outside the room. We had agents in the lobby. What we decided to do was a wake-up call. If he answered or we heard stirring in the room, we would know he'd be in there, or someone would be in there. We made several calls. We got no response telephonically. We heard nothing in the room. Mansoor must have gone out. They hoped he would return. Hours later, they spotted him. He was alone and heading back into the hotel. This time, they wouldn't let him slip away. Mansoor had long vowed not to be taken alive. He went for a gun and aimed at a detective. From the time I saw the gun to the time my weapon was fired, you're talking about two or three seconds. Well, not a whole lot of time to think about it. Um, you have innocent civilians in the lobby. Missing isn't an option. Even with three nine-millimeter rounds in him, Mansoor continued to struggle as they took him into custody. Because of their training, the arrest team was unharmed. Things had to be instinctive. Things had to be committed to muscle memory. And those reactions that occurred that morning were reactions based on excellent training. They were the byproduct of great training. So um, my, my recommendation to other agents would be receive as much training as you can. Try and get, the, uh, get, get it to the point where it's instinctive. The pursuit of Mansoor had lasted five months, involving more than a dozen law enforcement agencies. New York City emergency personnel tried to stabilize Mansoor, but he died en route to the hospital. His rampage was finally over. Not any one law enforcement agency can handle an investigation of this magnitude by themselves, and without the cooperation and efforts of all of the law enforcement agencies, I don't think Mansoor would have been caught without causing harm to someone else. Two thieves develop a terrifying pattern, combining bank robberies with home invasions and taking families of bank executives hostage. For years, federal agents track them, always one step behind. Even when they're caught, the robbers do not quit. An ingenious escape sends the fugitives on another crime spree, with the FBI once again on their trail.
Too often, convicted felons learn new techniques and find new partners in prison. In 1982, a group of former inmates began a spree of kidnapping and robbery. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. For years, the suspects used false names and a network of criminal contacts to elude capture. To find them, the FBI had to pierce their tight-knit circle and find new partners of their own. On December 28, 1982, Oklahoma City Bank Vice President Steve Thompson and his wife Ellen arrived home from a holiday party. Unexpectedly, a car pulled in behind them. When they got out of the car and started entering our garage, they hollered, Mr. Thompson, we're federal agents. They were on top of us, you know, with just in a few seconds. Ellen Thompson thought perhaps the men had the wrong house. I couldn't think of any reason federal agents would be coming to our house, and I've heard of mistakes before, so uh, I looked at him and said, there must be some mistake here. Can I see your identification? And he pulls out a gun. The one with the obvious wig seemed to be the enforcer. The other one was in charge. There was obviously one other male involved because somebody drove him to our house, and that car left and we never saw that car again. The two gunmen forced the couple inside. The leader began interrogating Thompson about the bank where he worked. He cooperated so the incident could end without anyone getting hurt. No, Thompson answered Thompson. some questions about the bank's complex security system, the doors but he knew the safety of his employees came first. And you I know. didn't give him names of actual people that had combinations and stuff. I said, we'll just have to wait and see who gets there and who has the combinations and stuff, because I didn't, you know, I didn't want to put any individuals in jeopardy. I see. A man called to speak with a gunman. Yeah. Uh-huh. It sounded like they were okay. finalizing plans for a robbery the next day. Well, call me back at 6.30. The leader warned Thompson to follow his orders exactly. Okay. He was trying to make a point with me, and, and, and he said, uh, if anybody sets off the alarms tomorrow, if anything goes wrong and the police come, he said, I'm going to kill the police. Tell me. He made the comment at that point. He said, he said, I'm not going back to the penitentiary. The gunman held the couple hostage overnight. An hour before dawn, they forced the Thompsons to drive them to the bank. Woman? At 9 a.m., they waited for employees to arrive. She's wearing a black dress, floral print. They had someone stationed outside as a lookout. She's coming in the front door. During the robbery, one person was in contact with somebody by phone the whole time. And they were able to give him detail as far as how many people were coming to the front door. The gunman knew only certain employees had access to the multi-layered security system. We got our visitors this morning, but if everybody cooperates, we'll be okay. Ma'am, I need to know, do you have the combination to the safe? No. I need no. you to come with me. Those without codes or combinations were shoved into a bathroom holding area. What's going on? Blonde? Tall? Act natural, everything will be fine. It always takes you know, more than one person to access anything. You have different layers of security within the vault and the cash vaults themselves within the vaults. Sir, I need to know, do you have the combination to the safe? It's okay. Yes, I do. I need you to come with me. Anyone with a code was put to work. So that's what he was trying to determine was who was going to be able to access that cash. Other employees had gotten them close. One final combination stood between the robbers and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Get it open. Don't play here. 
be stupid. The robber with the wig was the more threatening one. Do what you're told, no one gets hurt. Good, now get in there and fill them up. Within 30 minutes, the gunman had hundreds of thousands of dollars in hand. Did you get it? Got it. Come on. I need your keys. They herded Mr. Thompson and the manager in with the other hostages. He put me in one of the restrooms, and he told me and the people at our restroom that said, we're going to be here five more minutes. Nobody stick their head out. And they left, and I was pretty sure that, you know, from hearing the conversations out there, that they were going to leave right away. No, wait. So I probably waited, uh, you know, probably a minute and a half before I came out. When it appeared the robbers had gone, Thompson directed the manager to contact authorities. Go ahead and call the police. Yes, uh, Coal Creek Bank's just been robbed. Uh, we need the police here right away. The call went out to nearby Oklahoma City patrol units. Spot immediately to bank robbery at 1482 Olson Road. Following standard procedure, Oklahoma City police also contacted the FBI. Special Agent Mike Cycle took the call. I shouted to other agents uh, on the squad that uh, we had a bank robbery. I gave them the location and uh, gave them a, a little bit of information about what was going on, the fact that the robbers were gone, and uh, we had a bunch of agents in head for the bank. The patrol units arrived first. They approached quietly and cleared the bank, making sure no gunmen were still inside. FBI agents arrived minutes later. The Hobbs Act, enacted in 1946 to protect federally insured depositors, makes bank robberies the jurisdiction of the FBI. It meant a nationwide police force would investigate the crime and go after the robbers. The Thompsons described the ordeal that began in their home the night before. So no one was hurt. Didn't have anybody hurt. It had been a sophisticated, well-planned crime, with no evidence left behind. These robbers must have struck before. But no similar robberies had occurred in the area in the past. Agents searched the FBI's database to see if any had been committed elsewhere. They found a national file of robbery cases that included invasions of bank employees' homes. So I pulled that file out and found that there were several offices that had robberies where the pattern was very similar. So I started communicating with those offices. He hoped to find an agent who had experience with whoever robbed the Oklahoma City Bank and located Special Agent Steve Chenoweth like at the Phoenix FBI. Hey, listen. Cycle described the Oklahoma City home invasion style bank robbery, the robbers' disguises and their mannerisms. How many guys? Chenoweth immediately named two bank robbers he knew, Terry Connor and Joseph Doherty, and as having operated that way. All those things are, are typical of what they had done in the past. And so a lot of that, uh, once I learned the actual details, of what had occurred in Oklahoma City just uh, pointed a finger right at those two. Witness descriptions from Oklahoma City matched the felons. Because of his knowledge of the pair, Chenoweth became the lead case agent. 
he knew that Connor and Doherty had met in federal prison. Terry Connor was the leader, in for three Arizona bank robberies. Each time, he and his partner had held bank employees hostage overnight. Joe Doherty was just a thug from uh, Philadelphia and uh, was a stick-up uh, guy, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, uh, you know, gun in the right hand, maybe a note in the other hand, and, you know, give me what you got across the counter. Um, not a very sophisticated M.O. at all, and uh, certainly um, didn't have the smarts that Terry Connor had. Connor was a smooth talker, recruiting accomplices with ease. Terry was, uh, you know, primarily a West Coast guy, and uh, Terry, uh, being from the West Coast and being uh, from California, uh, we did certainly concentrate our efforts out there in California looking for him. Agents contacted the Monterey, California FBI resident agency. They told Special Agent Harlan Freimeyer what they knew about Terry Connor. Oklahoma City went on to tell us that uh, the suspicion was that he had a girlfriend that lived in Pacific Grove, California, and they wondered if he might not be heading that direction and asked us to do some work to see if we could work that angle. They located Connor's girlfriend's home. Routine surveillance revealed a possible link to Terry Connor, who was last believed to be in Oklahoma City. While doing a spot check on this residence, lo and behold, there was a vehicle parked out front with Oklahoma license plates on it. So I notified the Oklahoma City office, and uh, they didn't actually have a record of that vehicle that they could positively tie into Terry Connor at the time, but they thought it might have been one that he purchased under an alias. I'll tell you what, you ever seen that? While the girlfriend was away from the house, agents spoke with her gardener. Identifying themselves, they told him they were conducting a federal investigation. He needed to be truthful and discreet. They asked if he had recently seen any men at the residence. He hadn't, but recalled overhearing the girlfriend talking about meeting Connor the following week. The information I got was specific enough that we knew that on a given day, Terry Connor was going to meet somewhere with his girlfriend. And so I felt at that point in time that we were very close to Terry Connor. Agents followed Connor's girlfriend for days, learning that she drove several different cars. They placed tracking devices on each of them. With receivers in FBI cars and airplanes, they tracked her whenever she drove. But on the day she was to meet Connor, the signal faded. Once we lost the vehicle, uh, we were uh, spreading our vehicles out in all sorts of directions trying to locate the signal. And we had an airplane assisting us that day, and the airplane uh, uh, gave us the signal out on the highway, and uh, we picked her up again. Agents traveled toward the location of the recaptured signal. When they spotted the car, it was parked in front of a restaurant. There was no sign of the girlfriend or Terry Connor or anybody else that was associated with the car, so we uh, made a plan right then to establish full-time coverage on the car until something happened. Roger, stand down. All right, guys, we're still in stand down mode, stand down. A SWAT team waited, watching for any sign of the suspect. An FBI agent made sure that if the couple returned for the car, they couldn't drive it away. We let the air out of her tires so they wouldn't sneak in and sneak out real fast and waited. Most stakeouts mean long hours with no payoff. But the agents had to stick with it and hope that suspected bank robber Terry Connor would surface. After a hostage taking and bank robbery in Oklahoma City, the FBI developed two suspects, Terry Connor 
and Joseph Dougherty. Two months later, and 1,500 miles away in Atascadero, California, agents staked out a restaurant where Connor's girlfriend had left a car. They believed Connor was in the area, planning to meet her. The long hours of the stakeout paid off for FBI Special Agent Harlan Freimeyer. We just happened to see Terry Connor drive into the parking lot with his girlfriend, and uh, it doesn't usually work this way, but the photographs we had of Terry Connor were of such quality that it was easy to make instant recognition, so we knew that we were about to uh, accomplish our mission. The suspect was known to carry weapons, so a tactical arrest team took the lead. Please, please. FBI, FBI. They struck fast, giving Terry Connor no opportunity to flee. The girlfriend was questioned, then released, after investigators determined she was not involved in Connor's crimes. Give me a left hand. Agents then discovered an unexpected benefit to deflating the tire of the girlfriend's car. By the time we got to the point where we were making our arrest, he had already popped the trunk on his car. And of course, without a search warrant, we couldn't have gotten in there if he hadn't popped it for us. And so once the arrest was made, there we had in plain view the contents of his trunk, and that was useful to us because there was a briefcase that we opened and found a substantial amount of money. Nearly $40,000 in cash bore serial numbers matching some of the money stolen during the Oklahoma City robbery. Agents also found a large diamond and a jeweler's receipt for six more. Authorities took Connor to the Monterey FBI office, where they charged him with the Oklahoma City robbery. In handing over his personal effects during the intake process, something of interest emerged. A sales receipt from a Reno, Nevada car dealership. The buyer was listed as Russell Anderson, perhaps an unknown alias of Connor or Doherty. He had given an address in Santa Maria, California. My instinctive belief was that that address might well be the address of his partner, Dougherty. So we put out the word as fast as we could to our counterparts in Southern California, asked them to get out and check that address. A SWAT team immediately went to the residence and prepared to make entry. They suspected Dougherty was inside, perhaps armed. Bang grenade was designed to stun anyone in the house. Please, 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 please. By the time they got there, whoever had been occupying that address was uh, gone. I fear that possibly they were alerted by Terry Connor in, in the book in process when he was given his uh, phone call. Word that Connor was arrested, but that Doherty was not, went out to case agent Steve Chenoweth. Even though we're looking for two, we're certainly willing to take one. And uh, the fact that we didn't find Joe there was a little disappointing, but uh, also the fact that we did find Terry Connor meant that we had solved uh, half of that equation and we just had to up the ante to find Joe. Chenoweth knew Joe Doherty would keep robbing banks using the method taught him by Connor. But without Terry Connor controlling him, Doherty was a loose cannon, now more dangerous than ever. 
Terry was uh, the brains. Uh, Terry was the guy that made most of the decisions. And now you're putting uh, Joe, who is more prone to violence than Terry was, uh, basically in a leadership role. If he should fly off the handle, there might not be anybody there to calm him down. For eight months, there was no sign of Doherty anywhere. Then, in Phoenix, on the night before the busiest shopping day of the year, when banks are stocked up with cash, the vice president of a large area bank returned home with his family from a Thanksgiving dinner with relatives. What happened? It appeared their home had been burglarized. But the intruders hadn't left. Through the night, the two robbers held the banker and his family hostage. We just want to rob the bank. Just calm down. It looked like Joe Doherty was leading a new partner. And now that he was in charge, do you understand? Anything could happen. Settle in and be friends. Thanksgiving, 1983. They're told no one gets hurt. Give me the keys. Two intruders held a Phoenix banker and his family hostage overnight. Go start the car. Hours before dawn, Joe Doherty and his new partner were ready to rob the bank. They would use the banker's car for transportation and his children for collateral. Doherty never put down his weapon. Remember, I've got the gun on your wife. Get in the car. In less than two hours, they would drive to the bank, empty its vault, and escape with $270,000 cash, leaving the family frightened but unharmed. What's the address? The heist was in the home city of the lead case agent okay. on Doherty's trail. OK, put it out to all agents. When Steve Chenoweth learned of the crime, he believed he knew who had done it. Thanks. My first thought right away is um, Joe Doherty, but didn't know the answer to that until I started talking to the victims to get an actual physical description. Wondering if Doherty was taunting him by striking in his own town, Chenoweth headed to the banker's home to learn more details of a fearful night spent held at gunpoint. Most of us don't go through that, and uh, to go through it for an entire evening uh, with your two children uh, is a very scary thing. And so uh, they were glad it was over, and they were certainly glad to see us come. Jack, can you tell me just a little bit more about... The banker described the assailants, saying both wore obvious wigs, and the bigger one was in charge. Once I got the information, um, the physical description of the leader uh, fit that of Joe Doherty uh, right to a T. So I knew that we were dealing with Joe, but here again, um, we had another individual that he had picked up, and we didn't know who that guy was as his partner. Normally there. The family described how the pair had acted. Doherty and his new partner were more volatile and threatening than he and Connor had been. There's two people, two. But as before, they left agents with no leads. One bigger guy, one bigger guy that... Six months later, and 900 miles to the northwest in Reno, Nevada, local police called the FBI to another robbed bank. Once again, the heist was preceded by a hostage taking the night before. But this time, the level of violence had increased. Now, there was a bomb. They'd strapped it around the uh, bank officer, indicating that it was explosives. And if he didn't do uh, what he was told to do, that they would detonate that. And that certainly is enough to put the fear of God into you. And, and I would certainly do anything that they asked me to do. I won't stay with him.
determining there were no booby traps. A Reno police bomb specialist freed the terrified bank officer and sent him out of the vault to safety. cut off the power supply, though he later determined the device was a fake. The bank officer told the FBI that he and his family had been held hostage at gunpoint overnight by two men wearing wigs and business suits. Uh, recognize the gentleman in this picture right here? That's him. That's Shown a photo of Joseph Doherty, he said it looked like one of the men. Witnesses had seen a white sedan with Washington state plates speeding away from the bank after the robbery. So agents searched the area. They found the vehicle abandoned less than 200 yards from the Reno FBI office. It seemed Doherty was again boldly challenging the FBI. A check of the plates showed it was registered to a man in Spokane, Washington. That man said he had recently sold the car to someone who fit the description of Doherty and a pregnant woman whom the FBI believed to be Doherty's girlfriend. To help find the couple, the FBI called on the US Marshals, experts in the interstate tracking of cars and people. United States Marshal Denny Barrand believed the cars Doherty used would be the key to finding him. As fugitives, Joseph Doherty was very smart. He changed cars like some people change socks. Uh, he would uh, buy cars, sell them, sell them back to the original owners, sell them to a used car lot. Marshalls painstakingly followed a complex trail of cars and aliases and eventually got a break. They discovered a car accident report linking one of Doherty's aliases to an address in Idaho. Hi there. Since the house appeared to be abandoned, the marshals interviewed neighbors. Yeah, this, this is One woman is. immediately recognized the robber, though she only knew him by his alias. Yeah. She said he had the peculiar habit of shooting pistols in his backyard. Baby. And about a week ago, though, they packed up and moved away. She told the marshals that he, his girlfriend, and their newborn child had recently moved out. OK, go ahead. Securing a subpoena right from moving ahead. truck rental records in the area, okay. Marshall's determined Doherty's girlfriend had rented one under a false name right. and had driven Good. it to Colorado. Now I'll check on that before it leaves. Good. The rental company right. gave authorities her destination, a house in the mountains outside Denver. FBI agents and U.S. Marshals watched from the cover of the woods surrounding the house. Because there was now a baby involved, they had to be especially cautious. At one point, they observed the girlfriend leaving the house with another man. It wasn't Doherty. Marshals could not see if they had the infant with them. Other marshals followed the two into town and watched them enter a store without the baby. I said, go to the car that's parked in the shopping mall parking lot and look inside and see if they left the baby inside the car. It's a negative on the kid in the car. Uh, we're gonna go check out. And they radioed back to me, no, the baby's not in the car. And they didn't have the baby in arms. That means one thing. The baby's still at the house. Still at the house with Joseph Doherty. After two years of constantly being minutes too late, authorities believed they were finally going to arrest the dangerous robber. But in law enforcement, things rarely happen exactly as planned. Two years after Terry Connor and Joseph Doherty 
robbed an Oklahoma City bank. Connor had been captured, convicted of armed bank robbery, and sentenced to 25 years. The FBI believed his partner, Joseph Doherty, had continued a spree of hostage taking and bank robbery, but that they finally had him cornered in a Colorado house. Earlier that day, they had arrested the fugitive's girlfriend and a male associate. The girlfriend confirmed that Doherty and their infant child were still inside the house. And that Doherty was armed. A SWAT team fanned out in stations around the house. Copy number two. Number three, are you in position? Same thing, just moving around. Go. Also watching was U.S. Marshal Denny Berend. Joseph Doherty stepped out of the house, positively identified. And with that, he took a 357 Magnum and started to fire into the woods. But it didn't look like Doherty was firing at the agents. The SWAT team had to keep cool. I just hunker down. If you're not in danger, don't return fire. Don't return fire unless you're being threatened. The marshals recalled the neighbor in Idaho who had said Doherty often fired random shots in his backyard. They believed he didn't know they were there. Okay, just hold your fire. Hold your fire and let me know if he comes back out again. We're going to try him on the phone. They still needed to resolve the situation peacefully. An FBI negotiator placed a call to the house. Hello. This is the FBI. We have you surrounded. The negotiator he said, I established contact, but the person is hung up. It was answered by a male, but he hung up. Got it. The well-trained snipers had several possible shots at the fugitive but they held off. We had to consider, of course, the safety of the baby. We had to consider the safety of other people that might be in the home that we didn't know about. They've seen him go past the window several times. They see the baby. Has anybody caught sight of the child? Anybody seen the child? Still, they had to be ready if Doherty started firing at them. Again, try to get him on the phone. Stay by and be ready. The negotiator called the house again. You don't want the child to get hurt, come out of the house. He told the fugitive that his girlfriend and accomplice had already been arrested. Come out of the house. And asked Doherty to consider his child's safety and surrender peacefully. He hung up. All right, guys, he hung up. Let's move right, in. Move to the, the front, front now. Through the window, they saw him approaching the door. Once we had the baby out of the house, we had the house secured, then we began to move through it, and we discovered 16 firearms in that house, including a 308 tactical assault rifle, two of those, um, all hidden, all loaded, all charged and ready to go to defend that house. Doherty was charged and held for trial in Oklahoma. Almost a year and a half later, on June 19, 1985, 
two U.S. Marshals were transporting Terry Connor and Joseph Dougherty to an Oklahoma City courthouse. Oh, my guess, sure. Dougherty was facing the first of four trials, this one for the bank robbery and hostage taking in Oklahoma City three years earlier. He had subpoenaed his partner, Terry Connor, as a witness. <laughs> On a rural road, they made their move with smuggled jailhouse contraband, a handcuff key and a razor blade. They had never planned arriving at the courthouse. They took the marshal's guns. Pull over. And ordered them off the road. march the lawman into the woods. The felons were desperate for freedom, and it seemed no one could stop them from gaining it. June 19th, 1985. Bank robbers Terry Connor and Joseph Dougherty escaped the custody of two U.S. Marshals while in transit to Dougherty's trial. The fugitives handcuffed the marshals to a tree and stole their weapons, badges, and car. They were mobile, armed, and for now, no one knew they were back on the run. They had a 15-minute head start before the marshals managed to free themselves and report the escape. At the U.S. courthouse in Oklahoma City, Special Agent Steve Chenoweth was shocked when he heard the news. My initial thought was, uh, this can't happen. When you put so much time and effort into uh, a case like this over a period of years, and to have it just kind of disappear in a flash, in a moment's notice, um, it's a real severe letdown. Bank surveillance videos captured Connor and Doherty's next crimes. Two small-scale bank robberies in St. Louis. Agents believe they'd needed some quick cash before getting back to their regular routine. Initially, after the escape and after the fact that they had held up both banks there in, um, in St. Louis, and had about $30,000 cash. We knew that they were gonna be coming back out and striking again at a uh, bank, at a bank officer and his family. We knew that there was a potential, a high potential for kidnapping. Uh, we knew that the, uh, the uh, propensity for violence was great. Two months later, police in West Allis, Wisconsin, received Please, a bank robbery call. This is Sherry, can I help you? You're at what bank? Any address, please? A half million dollars was taken, the largest bank heist in the state's history. Station to squad 113, you're responding to a bank robbery, 10707 West National Avenue. It was by now an all too familiar pattern. Two gunmen had held the bank president and his wife hostage, then, again aided by a lookout, robbed the bank. Fingerprints placed Connor and Doherty at the scene. Local police called the Wisconsin FBI. Special Agent Dan Kraft was assigned the case. Reading witness statements, he saw that the fugitives were bolder than ever, no longer even using disguises. They did nothing to conceal their identity. They didn't do anything to really help by saying their names, but he, uh, Terry Connor did mention 
to the bank president's wife. He said, uh, the FBI is going to know who we are. Because of the continuing danger Connor and Doherty posed, both were placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives list. Media coverage drew many leads. Use your help on it. One call led agents to a man who might have been the robber's lookout outside the Wisconsin bank. Agents issued an APB for the alleged lookout's car. Days later, a state trooper pulled him over and called the FBI. Um, what got going on here? Once they identified him, they took him in. There was an active open warrant for him f out of uh, St. Louis for violating his federal parole. So we arrested him and I uh, brought him downtown to the FBI office. At first, the man refused to answer questions about Connor and Doherty. So we would talk. And this went on for five days. But it wasn't a sweating. I mean, you see on television where it looks like an interrogation and you're getting in somebody's face. No, it was just two men talking. Finally, Kraft won him over. But he was afraid of facing Connor and Doherty in court. I'd like to cooperate, he says, but you know, I won't testify. So you don't have to testify. We don't need your testimony. You know, we've got these guys locked in. I just need to know how they think. I need to know what they do and how they do it so I can get one step ahead of them. What they're doing. The suspect agreed to talk in the hopes of a reduced sentence. He told Kraft how Connor and Doherty chose the banks they robbed, how they traveled, even how they communicated through hotel front desks. One of them would call up and make a reservation in the name of a former prison warden. And the other one would call up and ask if this person had checked in yet. And uh, the switchboard operator would then say, no, uh, Mr. So-and-so hadn't checked in yet. And then they'd say, well, can I leave a message for him? So then the other one would then call back looking for messages. And they did this as one of their ways of uh, communicating without ever it being traced. The most important piece of information he gave was the name of another man who had helped Connor and Doherty rob banks in the past. His name was John Harris. Agents found Harris in Tucson, Arizona. Surveilling him, they saw him making and receiving calls at a certain payphone. Getting a warrant, they tapped the phone and listened in. He was talking to Connor and Doherty. We hoped through a series of wiretaps that we might be able to uh, trace the phone back to a particular area and through investigation in that area, maybe locate them. Agents learned the fugitives were calling from Chicago and were planning another robbery there. Special Agent George Spinelli of the FBI Chicago field office distributed photos of the fugitives to area hotels. One reported a guest who looked like Joseph Doherty, though that name wasn't on the register. As I looked at the register, I looked down and I did see an alias that Connor had used in the past. At that point, I thought possibly we had two top ten fugitives at this hotel. Case agent Steve Chenoweth immediately flew to Chicago, joining the other agents at the hotel. The guest who looked like Doherty appeared to have checked out. Agents watched the room Connor might be in. If he was there, they needed to confront him outside his room to avoid a standoff. We were very concerned that it could get violent, and uh, especially Connor, who had vowed that he would never be taken alive. We took uh, extra precautions at that point. An arrest team planned the takedown for the parking lot. Okay. All right, keep an eye. Okay. Sounds good. Eventually, the FBI agent spotted someone leaving the room. I think I might have something here. Come here, take, take a, a look. look. Yeah, got some activity. Can't see his face yet. It was Connor. 
That's Connor. He was That's alone. Tony, it's our guy. Take him. Take him now. Agents called for the SWAT team to make the arrest. So he did not have an opportunity to, uh, to get away. He was grabbed immediately. Although Joe Dockerty was not seen by agents, it appeared he was nearby and saw the police activity. A call came in to um, the switchboard asking what was going on. And it was a male and asking about uh, you know, the occupant maybe of a particular room. And uh, no doubt in my mind it was Dockerty. And he was trying to find out what happened. Agents searched the area but did not find Dockerty. The one thing they knew was that he would commit more robberies with a new partner. This guy doesn't have any other choice. He can't do a robbery by himself. He's got to reach out for somebody else. The FBI believed he'd call on John Harris and learned Harris had recently flown to San Francisco. Again, they spotted Harris repeatedly using a certain payphone. They ordered another phone tap. About a week later, uh, we get a phone call, and it was uh, Joe Dockerty. Dockerty said he was calling from St. Louis. But FBI technicians couldn't trace the call out of San Francisco. And all of a sudden, the stark realization came to us that this guy's not in, uh, in St. Louis. Uh, Dockerty is, is right there in that area. Agents realized he himself was surveilling his lookout to see if he had been followed. They hoped he hadn't seen the undercover agents. All right. All right, later. Believing his lookout was in the clear, Dockerty planned a meeting for the next morning there in San Francisco. Agents showed up early. Dockerty arrived as promised. And at about that time, we had a whole lot of very Weary FBI agents pounce on Joseph William Dockerty. And so ends the, uh, the saga, and so ended the chase. After a nationwide manhunt that lasted more than a year, Terry Connor and Joseph Dockerty were tried for their most recent crimes. They each received two life sentences, plus 139 years without parole. They are kept in separate federal prisons. Their partnership forever terminated. The nation's railroads become the conduit of a killer. He strikes at random, then disappears. Recurring clues tell police they face the worst predator of all, a ritual serial killer. He's cunning deadly and on the move. But the authorities are determined to stop him in his tracks. More than 200,000 miles of train track crossed the United States. From California to Kentucky, few living near a railroad felt safe in the summer of 1999. A serial killer rode the rails, picking towns and victims at random. He left behind a trail of bloodshed, but no trace of where he would turn up next. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. As the number of victims grew, the FBI enlisted the help of a profiler to help predict the killer's next move. On December 17, 1998, in West University Place, Texas, 
A young woman called the police from outside the house of a friend she worked with. She was worried about her. She told them that her friend, a prominent doctor at a nearby medical school, had failed to show up at work that morning. We'll be on the scene. Look, here they are. According to her colleague, this was completely out of character. She had not responded to phone calls to the house all day, nor had she answered her door. When they hung up, everything was fine. She said she'd see me tomorrow. And nothing out of the ordinary, and that, that was yesterday. The colleague was sure that something was wrong. The doors and windows of the house were locked. From the outside, everything seemed normal. The officers found that the garage door was unlocked. And inside, the door to the house, wide open. Jewelry on the floor suggested a robbery. The house had been ransacked. The officers moved cautiously an intruder could still be inside the downstairs was clear but a trail of clothes led to the second floor In the master bedroom, they found the doctor. She had been brutally murdered. 222, let me have a supervisor in a crime scene unit to the scene. Detective Kenneth Maha responded to the scene. Though a 10-year veteran of the department, he was surprised by the report of a homicide. West University Place, just a small little suburb, 2.2 square miles, right in the middle of Houston, largely residential and uh, an affluent community. And the last time we had a murder was in 1985 during a robbery of a pharmacy. The brutality of the crime struck the detective. Blood spatter was all over the place, in the hallway and on the, the walls and the door. Uh, the body was completely covered except for uh, one arm sticking out and, uh, and her two legs. There was a large butcher knife that was near the body, laying on a pillow. Investigators also recovered a heavy, blood-spattered, blunt object nearby. Both were weapons of opportunity the killer found in the house. Police contacted the doctor's husband and learned he had taken the couple's two children out of town to visit relatives before Christmas. They'd been gone for several days. The victim had work obligations to take care of that week, so she was not able to travel with him. Take a look at this over here. Evidence suggested that the killer had taken his time in the house. He tore open Christmas gifts and rummaged through the victim's belongings. The contents of her purse were spilled out, and her driver's license was clearly left out and displayed. It was a uh, it was quite strange to see it like that.
In the kitchen, the detective found partially eaten fruit. Possibly more evidence the killer had lingered in the house. He also found the keys to the victim's Jeep. According to the doctor's husband, it was the only set. In the garage, there were no foreign fingerprints at the suspected point of entry. But on a workbench, investigators found the broken cover of a steering column next to some pry tools. The killer must have stolen the victim's Jeep. We surmised then that he had to break the steering column of the Jeep uh, to actually crank it up and to start it. Here, the murderer made a crucial mistake. When I picked up the large piece of the steering column, I could visibly see fingerprints on the shiny black plastic. The column cover was bagged for later analysis at the lab. At autopsy, the medical examiner determined cause of death. Multiple stab wounds and blunt force trauma to the head. The victim had been sexually assaulted. The gruesome nature of the murder worried Detective Maha. It just didn't fit the pattern of a, a random killing. It was a step beyond. Investigators knew that killers like this usually don't strike only once. Two days later and 200 miles away, San Antonio police found an abandoned Jeep in a motel parking lot. The plates were traced to West University Place. It belonged to the doctor. The plastic cover of the steering column was missing. Inside, investigators found a guitar and a meat cleaver. The doctor's husband had noted that both items were missing from the house. Someone had hotwired the Jeep in a hurry. We noticed, too, that the uh, steering column was just an absolute uh, disarray. The Jeep was fingerprinted inside and out, but technicians found no usable prints. At the police department's forensics lab, analysts made electronic copies of the fingerprints lifted from the Jeep's steering column cover and ran them through an automated matching system. And at that time, we got a positive match on an individual named uh, Carlos Rodriguez. A computer check revealed another name, Rafael Resendez Ramirez. This was forwarded to the FBI's Criminal Justice Information Services Division. A search of their extensive database revealed dozens of other aliases and more information on Resendez. He had an extensive record going back more than 20 years and an active warrant on a stolen vehicle charge. Investigators reviewed the suspect's file from the Immigration and Naturalization Service and learned Resendez traveled regularly and illegally between the United States and Mexico. Most recently, he had been arrested in California for trespassing on railroad property with a loaded firearm and was deported to Mexico. Now it appeared that Rafael Resendez was back in Texas. His transient lifestyle would make him difficult to find. Detective Maha searched the suspect's records for a place to start and found the name of the fugitive's sister. She lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico. In a prearranged phone conference, Maha spoke with her at the Albuquerque Police Department. Hello? I'd be able to get some things, um, some information about your brother, if that'd be all right. 
She wasn't able to tell me a whole lot about uh, current activity of her brother. Uh, she did not have much contact with him. She did mention that he would sometimes uh, drift through Albuquerque, stay with her for a few days, and then just uh, disappear. Detective Maha asked her to call if she heard from her brother. And I think there was a little bit of anger and resentment on her part at, uh, at being having to be involved with it. She really didn't want to be associated with him if indeed he was uh, a real killer as, uh, as we thought that he was. Authorities also asked the public for help. They distributed wanted posters along the train routes Resendez was known to use. Dozens of tips turned up nothing. In March, three months after the doctor's murder, there was a series of reported hey. sightings in rail yards near San Antonio. Sector one, this is sector two. I've got Resendez had traveled 200 miles west. Each time, he fled before police could respond. The suspected killer was still on the move, hopping trains and eluding authorities. With thousands of miles of train tracks to choose from, Rafael Resendez could be anywhere. Five months after the doctor's murder, and only 90 miles away in Weimar, Texas, members of a local church went to check on their pastor. He and his Pastor. wife had not been at church that morning. The door's wide open. Pastor! 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 The couple was found, murdered in their own bed. Weimar's a small town. Murder is nearly unheard of. Texas Rangers and the Fort Bend County Sheriff's Office arrived at the scene. The preacher and his wife had been bludgeoned to death with a sledgehammer, a weapon of opportunity taken from their garage. The coroner set time of death at 24 to 36 hours earlier. The couple had been murdered late Friday or early Saturday morning. Money and valuables lay in plain sight. Robbery was clearly not the motive. Deputies processed the bedroom with luminol, a chemical that reacts to the protein in blood and other bodily fluids. It revealed the victim's blood and bodily fluid from an unknown source. Forensic testing later revealed the woman had been sexually assaulted. It appeared that after the murders, the killer had lingered at the crime scene. He ate in the victim's kitchen and took his time studying their driver's licenses. The investigators at the scene were unaware of the West University Place murder but not for long. In May 1999, Texas authorities were on the trail of a fugitive, Rafael Resendez. Fingerprints implicated him in the murder of a doctor in West University Place. Four months later, a preacher and his wife were found beaten to death in their home in Weimar. The couple's red pickup truck was missing probably stolen by the killer. Police put out an APB for the vehicle. At the Department of Public Safety, investigators from the Texas Rangers were troubled by the crime scene. The evidence in the house, partially eaten food and displayed ID cards, suggested a ritualistic killer Rangers contacted the FBI's Houston field office to get the opinion of a criminal profiler, Special Agent Mark Young. You have in a crime scene a lot of messages, a lot of forensic 
uh, evidence and a lot of behavioral evidence. You can pick up not only the forensics, the fingerprints, the DNA, the hairs and fibers, and those types of things, but you can also get a, a look into the offender's behavior. The way he commits that crime is unique. It's different than any other offender. Young noted that this killer acted with extreme rage, but no sign of panic. What really struck me behaviorally was this offender, uh, unlike a lot of others, spent an incredible amount of time in that house going through everything. Their wallet and, and purse, respectively, were opened up and their identification was showing. In other words, the offender sat there and looked at their photographs, did not taking any credit cards, not taking any cash. Profilers can analyze a killer's behavioral choices in an attempt to reveal details about him. In this case, after killing the victims, the perpetrator kept striking with his weapon, but then he covered their bodies this suggested perhaps even he was repelled by the results of his actions. Displaying the victim's ID cards might be an act of domination, as if he wanted details about the lives he had taken. One of the Texas Rangers Young spoke to had seen something like this before. He realized, because he had some knowledge of the case in West University, that some of the same types of things had happened. And he said, hey, guys, uh, you know, could this be connected? Not only are we looking at some MO that, that seems similar, but we're looking at behavior, uh, this uh, ritualistic behavior, or what we call sometimes signature uh, of an offender. If there was a connection between the two cases, the forensics lab would find it. One of the advantages we had is that we had forensic evidence in both places. We had uh, fingerprints and DNA evidence in the West University case. We also had DNA evidence at uh, the Weimar location. DNA analysis revealed that the bodily fluid recovered in both cases matched. The same man sexually assaulted both women. Since the first victim's Jeep had been recovered, investigators wondered how the killer got to the second crime scene. In both cases, a vehicle had been stolen after the crime. That would have meant, uh, traditionally, that uh, somebody had to bring the person there or that they were somebody from close by. Young studied the case file of suspect Rafael Resendez. There was information already in that fugitive investigation indicating that Resendez got around by train. According to the file, there were train tracks 50 yards from the doctor's house in West University Place. We turned around and looked. There's a train track immediately across the street from the Weimar location. With the two cases directly connected, investigators believed Rafael Resendez was a ritual serial killer. And the manner that he did these crimes is somewhat evolutionary. Uh, you don't just wake up one day and, and boom, get involved in that type of crime. It's something that you've uh, practiced, you've built up to, uh, and you've done before. And he's not gonna stop uh, all of a sudden either. They feared Resendez was using stolen vehicles and the railroads to find his next victim. At the Houston field office, the FBI's fugitive squad joined the hunt for Resendez. Special Agent Bobby Eckerd led the investigation. We knew that he had fled the jurisdiction and had most likely traveled interstate and, in fact, into Mexico. Because Resendez had likely left Texas, they obtained an unlawful flight to avoid prosecution warrant. It would allow the FBI to add its federal resources to the hunt. The first thing that we wanted to do is to find out everything that we possibly could about Resendez. We knew that he had been arrested over 13 times. I immediately started getting all the prison record pen packets so that I could identify not only relatives but associates, determine his patterns. 
All the interviews revealed to us that this was a man who was not well known by anybody. His family had not really had a lot of contact with him since he left home at 12 years of age and moved to Acapulco and eventually to Florida. With little to go on, criminal profiler Mark Young tried to unlock the drifter's past to predict his next move. He forwarded details of both cases to analysts at the FBI's Violent Criminal Apprehension Program. VICAP analysts use sophisticated databases to identify similar unsolved cases. Immediately, uh, they were able to return to me a case in Lexington, Kentucky. A Hispanic male had assaulted uh, a college student uh, and murdered uh, her boyfriend. This happened uh, late at night in 1997 near the railroad tracks where these two had been walking. The male was killed by his skull being crushed by a rock and the female was sexually assaulted. Uh, she was also physically assaulted pretty severe injuries. Though dazed by the attack, the young woman somehow survived. Seeing that her boyfriend was dead, she made her way to a nearby house where residents called the police. She was able to give them an artist depiction, uh, a local artist, of the offender. Young received the sketch from the Lexington Police Department. I compared it, and I didn't immediately say, wow, you know, this is him. What I felt was kind of an, a guarded optimism that this could be the same guy. But a sketch isn't proof. Young needed scientific evidence to be sure. He learned that the Lexington police still had DNA samples from the sexual assault two years earlier and arranged for the samples to be flown to the FBI lab in Washington, D.C. At the DNA analysis unit, examiners began processing the samples. Examiner Alan Giusti. We look at 13 different unique DNA regions and we develop an individual profile at each one of those regions. I describe it like looking at a person's physical characteristics. You can look at one DNA region and it might be the same as another person's. And that'd be like saying that two people both have brown eyes. Well, that's very common. You look at 13 different DNA regions, it's like saying somebody has brown eyes, is left-handed, is six foot three, is got red hair. The more DNA regions you look at, the more complete the picture you get of the person. After mapping the DNA profile of the perpetrator from Lexington, Juicy contacted the examiners in Texas who had mapped the samples from Weimar and West University Place. By comparing the results uh, that I obtained with the results they obtained, uh, we were both able to determine that we had a possible common donor. In other words, the same person was committing these crimes. In Texas, Young forwarded the news to the other investigators. I was able to call Lexington PD, and I heard a lot of hooping and hollering because they thought it was going to be an unsolved case. Lexington police now had Rafael Resendez as their prime suspect. Authorities across the Southwest canvassed homeless shelters and train yards. They knew Resendez was out there somewhere. On May 28th, Authorities found the preacher's truck abandoned near a train yard in San Antonio. It looked like Resendez had returned to the rails. Finding him would be an overwhelming task for Special Agent Eckert and her team. We had never faced this type of obstacle before. There are thousands of tracks, there are thousands of trains every day. And it was difficult to determine which line that he rode. With a massive search area to cover, they had to be resourceful. One way we handled this is we developed a small wanted poster that we gave to the people that frequently rode the railroads. 
In train yards across the nation, locals were advised to be on the lookout for Rafael Resendez. If they spotted him, they should call the FBI fugitive squad immediately. When we received these calls, we would contact the railroad police. They would pull the person off the train and identify them. Agents and railroad police responded to hundreds of sightings. Each time, it wasn't rescinded. The FBI's best lead was the fugitive sister in New Mexico. Agents stayed in contact with her, hoping she might hear from him. And if she did hear from him, they hoped she'd talk. So far, it seemed the only way to track Resendez was to follow a trail of bodies. On June 4th, 1999, a Fayette County, Texas woman stopped by her mother's house to check on her. The 73-year-old widow lived alone. The house had been ransacked. There was no sign of her mother. Mom! As she searched each room, her panic rose. Mother! Then, in the bedroom, she found her mother's body. The elderly woman had been bludgeoned to death. In 1999, Agents were on the trail of Rafael Resendez, linked to four murders in Texas and Kentucky. As his notoriety grew, the press dubbed him the Railroad Killer. Now, an elderly widow had been murdered in rural Fayette County, Texas. Like the other victims, she lived near a railroad. The gruesome crime looked like the work of Rafael Resendez, according to FBI Special Agent Mark Young. When you looked at that real brutal style of murder, you felt like, yeah, I'm going to be dealing with the same guy because she was covered similarly. There were uh, jewelry boxes that had been opened up in other rooms. Things had been opened and gone through, and there were items taken. It was a familiar and disturbing pattern. Cash and jewelry had been left behind. Instead, the killer stole trinkets and personal items, as if taking souvenirs. Fingerprints in the laundry room indicated the killer had broken in through a rear window. The print was later matched to Resendez. After slaying his victim, he was in no rush to leave. Not only did he go around to all of the rooms, take certain items, and spend an inordinate amount of time, uh, he went and had some fruit and uh, some bread, which was a thing that we had seen a, a number of times. I take that to be more of a signature, showing that I totally own and dominate this individual and their belongings, more than a, I'm hungry and I need something to eat two distinctive clues at the Fayette County scene seemed intended as a message to investigators. A newspaper had been placed on the sofa, open to an article about the recovery of the preacher's stolen vehicle. In a guest bedroom, they found a toy train. It had been recently unpacked and set up on the bed. It seemed the railroad killer was taunting the authorities. Right. A canine unit followed his scent to the train tracks. From there, the trail went cold. Less than 24 hours later, the next victim was discovered. 
another gruesome murder near railroad tracks. This one 95 miles from Fayette County. I got a call in regard to a crime scene in Houston that was being assessed by the Houston Police Department. Uh, they were noticing some similarities. A 26-year-old school teacher was found sexually assaulted and bludgeoned to death in her bedroom. Her driver's license had been removed from her wallet and displayed on a table. Like the other victims, she lived near railroad tracks. The teacher's car, a white Honda sedan, had been stolen. Later DNA analysis confirmed Resendez had assaulted the woman. Now he was killing at a much faster pace. One of the concerns we did have was that this guy was going to evolve into what we call a spree killer. Uh, a lot of times in the past, we've had serial killers, uh, Ted Bundy, uh, for instance, uh, that the pressure got so great uh, that they went into a spree mode, and that is they began to kill a number of victims with really no cooling off period. With his last two victims killed in a 24-hour period, it appeared Resendez had made the shift to spree killer. 2014, three-step protection on the conductor. Stepping in, air and brake, go up. On June 6th, a rail yard worker spotted the fugitive in Flatonia, Texas, halfway between Houston and San Antonio. 2014, we have a trespass on premises. Call central dispatch. Right he immediately in notified local police and the FBI. Once again, Resendez slipped away. Okay, guys, we've got some additional information. At the Houston FBI field office, Operation Train Stop was created. Now investigators from more than 30 agencies were assigned exclusively to the case. You'll remember we got involved Special in Agent Bobby Eckerd was part of the operation that was comprised of two basic squads. You had the one squad that was the serial homicide investigators that were looking into the various homicides, developing evidence of crimes. Then the other side was the fugitive investigators that their sole purpose was to locate, apprehend, and arrest Resendez. The fugitive squad looked for patterns in the suspect's past. We were able to determine that he followed the crops um, throughout the United States. In Washington state, he followed the avocado route. In Florida, he would be involved in the citrus crops. In Kentucky and North Carolina, he would pick tobacco. After identifying farm work sites and addresses of friends and family, agents would try to eliminate these comfort zones go everywhere that you can possibly think of that the fugitive might show up. By going there, by law enforcement presence in those places, people aren't willing to help out the fugitive anymore. But this fugitive was comfortable traveling fast and on his own without any help. And his murder spree was not yet over. Eight days after the school teacher was killed in Houston, her car was found 300 miles away near the Mexican border. Inside was a knife, but no sign of where Resendez had gone. Nearby were train tracks, giving the killer a clean escape to almost anywhere. In 1999, more than 30 law enforcement agencies hunted for Rafael Resendez, known as the Railroad Killer. Whenever a new crime appeared to be the work of the killer, Special Agent Mark Young investigated. I was getting hundreds of calls from departments around the country wanting me to uh, listen to their stories about their crimes and, and determine whether uh, the cases might be linked. On June 15th, the bodies of a 51-year-old woman and her father 
were discovered in their home in rural Gorham, Illinois. The local sheriff's office believed Resendez was involved and called Mark Young. As soon as we walked onto the scene, we could have been in one of our crime scenes in Texas. The double rail tracks were right behind uh, the older man's residence. The killer broke in through a back window. He used a weapon of opportunity, a shotgun he found in the home. He stole a few trinkets and ate the victim's food. But this time, the killer had added something new, a statement scrolled on the wall. A lot of people thought, oh, God, we got some other type of offender here uh, that's making a political statement. But Young knew better. He had reviewed the fugitive's prison file, including his correspondence. He had been writing political messages and letters that we were able to view in the past. That was even further indication to me that this is the same offender because this now is the rest of his fantasy coming out. In his own mind, Resendez was a deep political thinker. But authorities knew he was a vicious predator. He was tied up in his chair. She was straight across the off table. They believed he got to Gorham on the train and left in the victim's car, which was recovered the next day, 60 miles south near the Kentucky border. Police across the country checked cold cases looking for murders Resendez might have committed. Special Agent Young investigated one in Hughes Springs, Texas. In October of 1998, a woman had been beaten to death with an antique flat iron. Though unsolved, the murder had been thoroughly investigated and documented. And I felt like there was a good possibility that Resendez was responsible for that case, too. We had blunt force trauma. Uh, she was an elderly victim. She was not uh, sexually assaulted. But she was covered in a similar fashion. And in looking at his crime scene photography, I see where uh, her identification had been placed up as if the offender looked at it. Because it happened in home. Because the spree killer could be anywhere, the FBI placed Rafael Resendez on their 10 most wanted fugitives list. His mug shots were posted with 30 different aliases. Special Agent Bobby Eckerd hoped it might shake new leads free. What this does is it raises the awareness of the case, the fugitive status, and it also allowed for us to offer up to $50,000 for the successful apprehension of Resendez. News of the Resendez case swept through the country. On heightened alert, agents and police searched hundreds of freight trains and train yards. It was as if Resendez had disappeared. Violation. Don Clark, uh, then special agent in charge of the Houston field office, held press conferences to help spread the word. But he was candid about the case's difficulty. Uh, it's a very complex investigation. It's one like many of us have never been involved with before. Uh, we are dealing with a lot of unknowns here. We're dealing with a lot of pieces of information, and it's a very difficult investigation for all of the agencies. The story led news broadcasts nationwide. And with eight victims now dead, the public was terrified. Eight is more than enough, many more than enough. One is more than enough. And that's all that I can assure the public is that law enforcement is working together to try and get this person out of the street. The fugitive was deceptively smart and incredibly dangerous. He could move across the country easily and slip across the border at will. What we were trying to let people know was this is not some railroad hobo or bum uh, that doesn't have any sense traveling around. This is a guy with a good IQ uh, that knew how to evade law enforcement, uh, that we needed a lot of assistance in capturing. This is a guy that was attacking innocent people in their sleep 
and there was nobody really safe. The reward for the fugitive's capture climbed to $125,000. Calls came in from all over the country. In late June, Resendez was spotted at a homeless shelter in Louisville, Kentucky. But he never stayed in one place for long. Before the police could arrive, he was gone. Sergeant Mark Barnard of the Lexington, Kentucky Police Department warned the public. Uh, if I lived near a railroad track, I'd certainly have it well lit. Uh, I'd check and make sure nothing is uh, out of the ordinary. I'd know my environment, my neighbors. I'd check my doors and windows. The tips kept coming. We had 3,178 calls that came into the command post. From those calls, we generated over 1,100 leads. In other words, things that needed to be done throughout the United States and in Mexico. One credible tip was phoned into the Denver field office. The caller reported seeing Resendez at a house in Commerce City, Colorado. After authorities traced a phone call from the house to the Mexico town where Resendez had family, a tactical arrest team responded and moved in for the capture. Seven months into the search for Rafael Resendez, an arrest team raided a house in Commerce City, Colorado. They secured the occupants and searched the house. But Resendez was nowhere to be found. And authorities later determined the tip was a case of mistaken identity. Texas Rangers and the FBI agents kept in contact with the fugitive's sister in New Mexico. She assured them that she had not heard from her brother, but promised that if he called, she would contact them. But at the FBI command post in Houston, the next big lead concerned a relative no one knew about before. Agents learned Resendez had a wife in Mexico. Special Agent Bobby Eckerd followed up on the surprising new lead. The command post became aware that he had a common law wife because she was interviewed by Mexican media. And a local station got a copy of that interview and showed it, aired it locally. At that point, we brought his wife to Houston for a two-day interview. Authorities needed to know as much as they could about Resendez, his patterns, and the places he had stayed. And did he write you all the time? She provided us with a lot of information about Resendez and his habits over the last two or three years. She advised that he brought her jewelry, he brought her figurines, sometimes little angel figurines. He brought her a guitar. I knew that a lot of these items had been stolen from crime scenes, and it in fact turned out that these items were linked to the homicides. She said Resendez had been in Mexico very recently, but she hadn't seen him in days. How were you made aware of that? She was cooperating because she feared he wasn't safe there. In Mexico, bounty hunters were after him. Resendez was running out of places to hide. On July 10th, 1999, investigators received a phone page from Albuquerque. It was the fugitive's sister. Yes, I'm returning your call. She needed to talk to authorities. OK, we're on our way. According to Special Agent Mark Young. There were relatives in Mexico uh, that were being approached by law enforcement, by uh, bounty hunters, by curiosity seekers. Mr. Lopez, thank you for the page. Um, there were people that really didn't care how they got him across. You know, dead or alive, I want the reward money. She said her brother had called her. She did not want him to be harmed. Law enforcement told her that uh, we could effect a safe surrender for him and we would agree to treat him humanely uh, and 
get him in custody uh, to resolve this thing. On July 12, 1999, Rafael Resendez agreed to turn himself in to a Texas Ranger at a small border crossing. Hands on the head. Respecting his sister's wishes, authorities agreed to let him walk across and to take him in with a minimal arrest team. One of the most vicious serial killers in the nation's history was taken into custody quietly and without incident. In follow-up interviews with Mark Young, Resendez would confess to a total of 13 murders, four of them not yet connected to him by authorities. He could recall in incredible detail crimes that occurred several years before. After discussions with him, I would contact the uh, jurisdictions that had primary uh, control of the investigations that, that he was referring to. And we uh, resolved two homicides in Florida, Marion County, Florida, uh, one in Colton, California, uh, and uh, uh, one homicide in Barrow County, uh, Georgia. You tell me the train. The question in everyone's mind was why. In the interviews, Resendez made the sickening claim that he killed to wipe out evil. Yet among his victims were a doctor, a preacher and his wife, a teacher, and elderly people. Did you murder? All upstanding citizens, well loved by their families. The search for Rafael Resendez took eight months and cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. In court, he attempted to use an insanity defense to explain his crimes. But in May of 2000, he was found guilty of first-degree murder. Four days later, Rafael Resendez was sentenced to death. <laughs> 